Welcome to the Business Excellence for Managers podcast, which is dedicated for all of you leaders and executives who would like to continuously improve your business performance. This podcast is sponsored by Wave Business Excellence Footprint, the digital training company that cares about your development, your employees' development, and your business performance. You can find the courses under www.wave-bef.com. Today's episode is all about the world of IT and your company's digital transformation. My special guest today is Ali Davachi, who is a Forbes author, a digital transformation expert and founder CEO of Realware LLC. His goal is to provide frictionless technology that liberates business and accelerates outcomes. Ali says that the best businesses have a secret sauce, which is their unique value that makes them distinctive to other similar businesses and powers their success. And yet, when they try to leverage technology that promises to optimize and accelerate their businesses, they find that the technology forces process changes that compromises their unique value. This is exactly where he and his team can make a digital transformation journey a successful one. I'm excited to introduce you to this amazing guest, Ali. Hello, Ali, and uh, welcome to the Business Excellence for Managers podcast. It's so great to have you here. Thanks, Juan. It's great to be here. Thanks for your time. And one question I'm so curious about, could you tell us your story and how did you get to where you are today? Because looking at your CV, it's amazing. <laughs> and I'm always curious to see how certain people take that path to the path, for example, the one that you took, which is really, really exciting. Uh, so I started actually, uh, when we go way back to my early days, I actually wanted to be a physician. You know, that was a little bit too slow moving for me. So I decided to switch to technology and I'd always been hands on with technology. And my parents used to tell me that as soon as I got anything that had a battery, I would take it apart. I wouldn't play with it. I would take it apart. So my life has been really uh, around fixing things and making things better. And so I started my first business in the early 90s. It was a hardware company. So there's a common thread through all of our businesses, which is put users back in control. I've always been focused on how do we make technology, which in the early 90s, late 80s was very hard for people to understand. And, you know, only very few people had it. How do we democratize? How do I democratize this and make it so everyone can be as comfortable with it as I am? And so I started a hardware company uh, similar to Dell, right? And we sold that about five, six years later. And then I started an internet company with the same idea. How do I make the internet easy for people to use? And this was when everything was still on three and a half inch floppy disks, right? <laughs> so I wrote the software. Like I am a software engineer, a hardware network. I understand all these things. Um, I actually never finished school. I left school after a year to start my first business. So I've always been hands on and in depth there. And so basically it was just kind of just being so focused on the customer. What is the value that we can deliver to the customer? And we should always be committed to that no matter what. It doesn't matter if it makes our lives as engineers harder. We are here to serve that value. How do we get them that value? Um, so then I sold that business to a cable company. Um, so that's two exits. And then I started helping other companies after that. I decided I wanted to take it easy. So a lot more thought leadership, consulting around this mixture, because again, not a lot of people could speak to the business entrepreneurial growth mindset, as well as the technical. I started this instance, now this entity in 99, our tagline was bridging the gap because it was just me. And that's what I was doing. <laughs> I was talking to both sides and then connecting, yeah. translating the language <laughs> and making sure everybody understood what they needed to do. And so Realware now has been operating for 25 years. We're, I'm really grateful for our clients and our people. We are uh, serving an international client base and it's everything from healthcare, large healthcare, Fortune 50 to startups, um, B2C, B2B businesses. Because we've built, again, the idea, again, put users, now it's a business user instead of an end user. How do we put business users back in control? Remember, or the challenge as a business team leader or a team member is you come up with all these great ideas, you want to get in market quickly, and you're now like, hmm, is IT going to let me do this? Or can we even do it? Or are there going to be limitations? Or your agency is removed. You always have to ask permission to someone else who really may not even understand what you're trying to do. And they may not have the budget, they may not have the ability, they may not have the tools. And so that's always been a separate discussion. So we built, or I should say, I built platforms in the late 90s, early 2000s that were designed at the very core to be extensible, 
and uh, use a composition architecture so that we could adapt our ideas, our business customers' ideas very quickly and then give them the agency to run the platforms without us anymore. And that's our whole business, is we have several platforms we call smart SaaS platforms. We can manage them, host them, deliver them, but also give them to anyone to manage. I give you an example. We have a Fortune 50 using our enterprise CMS package, and they used to have a couple hundred people. Now they have less than 20 running the same platform. So that's what happens when you give people back control. It's amazing what they can achieve. That's really powerful what you've said, because I've been over 20 something years in the corporate world, and I've always seen that discussion between the process world and the IT world and how they just cannot communicate with each other. And every time we <laughs> yeah. were hiring somebody, for example, for my team, which was the process improvement team, I was always trying to look for people who could understand both of these worlds. And the guy who knows a little bit of about IT, and of course, he should know a lot about process improvement, but it was so hard to find these people in the market. And every time we were in, in correspondence with the IT departments to uh, make them understand what is it that we need from them, because we just did perhaps a project, maybe we did a process improvement workshop with the team, and we know exactly what needs to be improved in the process. But the IT side, they did not know exactly what is it that we wanted and, and why did we need it. And so it was always a, not an easy time to get those improvements, especially the IT improvements, because we did have like those quick wins that you can just implement easily without IT help. But I would say almost 80% of the improvements that we had out of those workshops were something connected with IT department who needed to help us. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then, of course, the implementation was just, it took forever. Yeah, it, the project maybe took somewhere between two to three months, but then the implementation itself could take maybe over a year, maybe two right. years. And that was sometimes frustrating for a lot of people in, in the company to see that kind of speed. And, and then people just think, well, do I really want to do another project if it's always a struggle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and what are some of the key questions that a business leader should ask themselves prior to considering a technology upgrade or a digital transformation? Because that's something much bigger than what we used to do in, in the company where we had those projects and then we had those improvements and then IT had to just optimize something. But a digital transformation is something a little bit bigger. And that's, for example, if somebody is uh, acquiring another company and you got to then unite both uh, IT platforms and, and other large, I would say, situations to you do require a digital transformation. Could you tell us more about that? Sure. So I think one of the big things that I tend to try to get people to do is kind of lift up above the implementation layer. So most people, when they talk about digital transformation, they're talking about the actual execution of what you just mentioned, bringing two systems together, migrations, you know, new feature sets, those kinds of things that are very tactical in nature. They may have a strategic reason. I hope they do, but they are much more tactical in, in nature. And I think as a senior leader is this question, right? When I look at even consulting or advising clients, I'm trying to understand, again, the value, right? What is the value? Are we, and, and the customer may be an internal customer, maybe an external customer, maybe a combination of both. But one of the things that we are very big proponents of from a transformation perspective is making sure that everyone in that transformation understands what is the actual value proposition that we're delivering to the customer? Because that gets lost. In most projects that I've seen that fail, people may not even know what that value proposition is when they started. They were just given a bunch of tasks or said, we're going to implement X, and there was really no reason given to them of the outcome. So as human beings, we want to know what is our work going toward? What are we trying to create? And unfortunately, in larger hierarchies, that communication from the top tends to get watered down as it gets to the individual and might even evaporate. Like we use this sort of idea that where the spring is and where the work is getting done sometimes is so far away that there's no connection anymore. And that's when there's a huge problem with communication and culture. And if you don't understand the common goals, you don't have a common language anymore. And that's where IT and the business and process and finance, if we ensure that this communication is happening clearly and consistently, then that common language usurps the local language, which is tribal, right? So if you think about this at a very human level, you know, I'm not talking about bits and bytes and speeds and feeds right now. I'm saying the IT team has their own language. The finance team has their own language. The Six Sigma people and the lean people have their own language. Everyone has their own language so they can effectively work together. But they also need to have this global language that they can then use to communicate 
the values and the reasons across areas. So I would think as a senior leader, not I would think, I implore senior leaders when they're looking at large business impacting projects, no matter what they might be, digital transformation, transformation of any kind, innovation, integration, acquisition, that you are setting that tone, that you are setting that language and ensuring that everyone understands what that language is and why is it there and ultimately delivering the value. Because once you do that, everyone can very much easily get behind it and understand it and connect themselves to that outcome. And again, that's why we call rapid an outcome-based process because it's all about the outcome, making sure they're all communicated and clearly understood. So that's the culture part of it. Of course, you know, we could sit here for hours and hours and hours and talk about different strategies for implementation and all. But at the end, if you don't get the culture part right of the project, you have a very low chance of actually succeeding and delivering that value at its fullest. You might deliver some of it, but to get the absolute best out of it, you need to make sure that that culture around the project or around your organization as a whole is ready and able to speak to it properly. At the end of the day, it's all people business. Yeah, We're all dealing with people. And if you cannot get them all in the same boat, then everybody's rowing a different direction and you're just not getting anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> or using yeah. different kinds of roars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. And what I also really liked what you mentioned was about the value proposition because that's always directed or directly linked to the customer expectations. And that is something that I think a lot of IT companies or IT departments within companies, they miss it out a little bit because they do not ask themselves the question, what is it really what our end user needs? What is it our customer needs? How should the end service or product look like? And that I think is sometimes not directly, I would say, visible for the IT people, what I've seen mm -hmm. in the past. And that's why I really uh, enjoy listening to that, how you explained it today, because I'm like, okay, that really shows me that, as you said, you're bridging the gap yeah, between the process people, the IT world, and what the customer really needs from the company as an outcome. Can you tell us the dangers that a business has when their IT systems take on a life of their own? What does that actually mean when they take I a life of their own? I love that question. I love that question. Again, this is another topic I could talk about for ages. So we have something that we call myth busting in the rapid process. And I'm sure as a process person, you've heard this. Well, we've always done it this way or we do it this way, but we don't know why we do it this way. And, you know, this is the same thing where process also can have a, a life of its own, right? There was some reason for it at some point and it was never reviewed again because it just became part of the corporate slash community mythology of what happens in that organization. But technology has a very insidious negative drag effect, especially the further away you get from the implementation of that technology. For me, it, it's effect on agency and agility. So the, for the business to react quickly to market fat, fat forces, to react themselves, to be able to act themselves, to be able to get the insights they need in a way that doesn't require an army of people to provide that to them. Because typically, as you mentioned prior, we have a two-month project and then it takes a year well, maybe after the end of that year, the world has changed again. Just imagine, I hate to bring it up even, but imagine you did a project in 2019 and then you started it in 2020. Now you're in lockdowns. Did you even need that project anymore? So, so the, the, the windows of time need to be much more aligned with what the business needs are and less what the implementation needs are. Technology can do grill. Get me wrong. I'm a propeller head. I love technology. I love playing with technology. And we implement it all the time, but I see a lot. I, I think um, the technology approach is usually what causes the problem, not the technology itself. And that's where you really need to start looking at the transformation of how technology is viewed within the business as well. Like, for example, if technology is reporting to a finance function, then it's not considered a strategic advantage. That's a clear indicator. When we look at an organization, <laughs> if tech reports to finance, then it's simply considered like the paper you put in your laser printer. I hate to be so blunt, but yeah. it's how do we control the costs in technology, not how do we go after growth and use technology as a strategic advantage. That's right. Especially nowadays that I think that there is no company that can survive out there with a good technology. If they do not continuously improve the way they do their IT and their processes that are linked to the IT, then I don't think they will have a big chance to be one of the pioneers at what they do. Because if I look at the speed, how things are developing nowadays, maybe looking back 20 years, you know, the way how companies have developed and, and the services and products that are being out there in the market, 
you have a, a longer life cycle of that service or that product. And nowadays, the life cycle is much, much shorter. So therefore, mm -hmm. we have to adapt all our processes. We got to adapt the IT infrastructure in a way that we can really be more flexible and agile so we can just adapt it much quicker to what the customer needs. Exactly. And I think that's why it fits really good to your book that you have written. It's called Rapid. So I think Rapid is also probably a very good title. And could you tell us more about uh, this book? Sure. The book is really the culmination of 20 years of helping companies and growing my own companies around this customer focus. So Rapid really stands for Research, Analyze, Plan, Implement, and Decide. And so the idea is those core functions do a couple things. First, they remove emotion from the process. So one of the things that I've found in a lot of organizations that tend to go a little bit off and need help is they started making decisions with, you know, the age old, my gut or my intuition, and they stopped using data. They stopped using facts. They stopped staying focused on the customer. So what Rapid provides is a, again, a framework to drive that cultural communication and that cultural change within an organization, because I believe work is just another community we participate in. And when you look at work as another community, you should want to go there, right? And I've never seen any community or any participant in a community that wanted to join a community and fail, right? So these are things that Rapid tries to deal with because when you start looking at things purely from a research perspective and then you analyze them and then you start making decisions around planning and then you start implementation and then ultimately the most important thing is the decision making process because I find that again a lot of businesses that end up stalling or projects failing people stop making decisions and decisions are the lifeblood of progress if you can't make decisions you can no longer progress progress forward and frankly and when I coach people and teams and companies, I say, you know, you made a decision to stop making decisions. <laughs> so yeah. that, that was a decision. So how do we shake that? How do we make sure that that doesn't happen again, that you have what you need to comfortably and confidently make decisions? Of course, no system will get it so that every decision is always correct. But if you have all the information you need to make a decision, then you can also make another decision that says, hey, that decision we made two months ago probably wasn't perfectly right and we need to adapt. We need to make another decision to, you know, maybe go back and do a little more research, maybe do a little more analysis, maybe plan a little bit better, but we need to keep moving forward. So that's what Rapid is about. Rapid is about distilling success, the success process that I've used for 25 years into something that's much more structured. That's not much more because we do it the way we do it is structured, but provides that structure and easy to understand method. I've read lots of business books, as I'm sure you have, and you get to the end and you're like, yeah, those are great ideas, but how do I do it? <laughs> well, Rapid doesn't just give you the ideas and the concepts and the methodology. It also gives a bunch of tools, how to start working, how to start doing these things in your own organization. And you can start using Rapid by yourself or you can teach your team. As a matter of fact, we started another organization that teaches the rapid methodology to teams and organizations. And it's more of a general methodology around strategy, execution, things like things of that, so that we can help people understand, listen, this isn't so hard if you just have a methodology that you're willing to follow that everybody, tech people, business people, CEOs can all understand. That's the thing we did is I made sure that it's not a tech methodology. It's not a business methodology. It's a business execution methodology, which requires all of those things. And all of those areas can use it to better communicate, number one, because that's the most important thing. Align. Uh, we call it uncover, agree, and align. So uncover the values, uncover what you need to do, agree on that, and align on that. And once you do that, it's amazing what people can accomplish because they can just do what they need to do without worrying about, am I doing the right thing? If I make this decision, what's going to happen? No, you can free them and let them really shine and show you what they're capable of. So that's really nice because it's like that little cycle and that cycle it always empowers them to make, make the next step because if they have the wrong habits within the organization that they have the, I would say the wrong culture that nobody has the guts to make any kind of decisions and everybody's saying, well, we need to look into it and maybe the next person when he's back from holidays, he will then exactly. uh, make a meeting to discuss about it and then we will create maybe a small focus group and then we will see. So at the end, you're like, okay, guys, <laughs> somebody has to decide at the end. Yeah, we, we need to get on with this. Yeah. And, and, 
And then finally, a couple months later, you find out that there was something decided. Yeah? And you say, okay, who decided that? Because we need to know now exactly the direction and the steps that we need to make. And everybody's like looking at each other. It's like, no, that was that person, was that person. And nobody really knows who made the final decision. Yeah? <laughs> so that is really a culture shift and a culture yes. change for many companies now where they have to really uh, use that cycle, as you just mentioned right now, and to make the cultural shift so that, first of all, everybody understands the same language. And it's not like that high level language that we need a doctor degree to understand, but it's just a simple language that everybody in the organization can find out, okay, what do we need to do next? Then next step, we execute, we decide, execute, decide, and then finally we will see then progress. Yeah, exactly. I really like that concept. I should have read your book a couple of years back. <laughs> <laughs> Since when you have the book The book uh, available? was published February 2nd, 2022, so 2-2-22. Two, two, <laughs> I probably needed it like 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, well, I started in uh, the late 80s. So, yeah, it's been 30 yeah. years in the making. So I finally sat down and decided to write. It took me almost oh. two years to write it because I'm a software guy. I'm not a English major. So. <laughs> <laughs> and how much of the impact does business change management play in the success of the digital transformation of the projects? Because some of it you already mentioned. And I think some of the factors maybe have 20% influence, other things have 10%, other things have 40% influence. But just the sheer fact of uh, looking at the factor business change management, how much do you think that uh, play a role in having a successful digital transformation? That's an interesting question because, of course, it depends on the scale of the change. I would say it's a linear relationship. So the larger the change, the more change management is required. I keep coming back to the people side of this, right? So change management at the systems level, pull requests and source code control and documentation control and traceability and all those things are great. But if you can't distill that and manage the change you need in the way people think and work within the group, I think that's what's missed a lot. It tends to be this really big focus on the change management process and not the change management impact on the people. Yeah. And so I think if I was putting the priority, I would say change management impact on people is much higher and always a priority, regardless of the size of the change. And change management procedures are sized to the scope of the change. Does that make sense? Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. That's how I think yeah, about perfect. change management when I look at the projects that we do for clients. Very good. Yeah, that's similar the way how when we are doing deployments of large quality initiatives within companies or if we are deploying Lean or Six Sigma, it was also very similar. Yeah? And that I think it matches very well to what you just said as, right now as well. So how do we change the mindset of most organizations to make sure that business outcomes are the key drivers for all IT and digital transformation? So I think everyone knows that outcomes are the key. They just may not be putting them as high priority as they should be from a communication perspective. So one of the things we do in our transformation projects or our transformation work or our training is we have a concept we call one degree of change. And the idea is, especially in larger organizations where people will be disconnected you know, every sort of circle you go away from the core of the change, you have people that have less and less impact and less and less knowledge of that. We want to try to generate as much momentum as we can within the human ecosystem. And that is why we call it one degree of change. So one of the things we do in Rapid is we have a project prioritization process, which everybody has, right? Once you go through the analysis, you're going to build all the projects you need. But part of that is, which are the ones that are low hanging fruit? We actually call those out separately because we want to implement those and show that the process works and there's benefits to not just the outcomes of the organization, but to the people who are impacted by the change, their outcomes are also going to be easier to create, more frequent, et cetera, et cetera. So again, thinking about this from the human aspect, that one degree of change mentality really does help drive that support because you need everyone's support. You know, you can't operate a company without human beings. You could technically do it without a computer. You can't do it without humans. <laughs> so, <laughs> so leaving them out of the calculus is what most people do, and it's really a huge mistake. And then the other thing we have is we have another idea, which we talk about, which is uh, fear is fuel. And it's meant to be bombastic. That's why I use fear and not doubts or risks, because that tends to reduce the idea. But when you do something that you care about, and you start to have misgivings. There's something in the, like, you're in the back of your head saying, oh, I don't know, I don't you know, maybe it's not a right, you know. We say don't run away from that. Look at that. 
because that's an indicator and a data point that you can use to then ensure or harden your approach to have a higher likelihood of an expected outcome. And what most people do is they turn from that and they run in the other direction, right? They don't want to approach it. They don't want to address it. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. I just know how people behave in these environments that I've seen where things are failing and nobody wants to take responsibility. As you said, you go away, you think someone's going to come back from holiday and they're going to make the decision. No, you're capable of making the decision if you would just take the time, look at what's causing your doubts, and then analyze it, put it in remediation and the, or the compensating controls or plan B, plan C, right? Yeah. And then you can just move forward. So those are kind of the core things that we use to try to get that momentum and keep things moving in a positive direction, knowing that, of course, things are going to go wrong. I mean, if you're thinking that nothing's going to go wrong is the first big mistake. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Probably if you've seen as well in each organization, you have a group of people who are the innovators, the other group are the early adopters, then you have the late adopters, then you have the resistor. And many people I've seen in the past, they're always very, I would say, maybe the word annoyed is a bit too strong, but they're a little bit afraid of the resistors group. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, you should not be afraid of the resistors group. They are the ones who actually can help us to navigate this program forward even easier because we should really bring them in. We should uh, speak with them. We, what is the source of your resistance? What are your doubts? And many times we figured out that through their experiences that they've had from previous companies or from previous rollouts that they know exactly what are the things that went wrong. And that's why they're now resisting. So we say, hey, that's perfect because I can take that experience that you just had as a negative experience and we'll turn it around, we'll flip it and let's make it now bulletproof what we're going to do now for the future. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I, what I heard from what you were saying, it's a good way to get people on your side. And also, I think I like the point which you mentioned about those quick wins. Because if you have those quick wins, then you're already generating that energy and that, that momentum. You're building up the momentum where people say, hey, this is actually working. Let's do more of this. So that's, that's perfect. Yeah. I, I really like that. <laughs> I have two more questions. One of my final questions here, second last one is, how do we keep the risk levels low when doing a digital transformation? That's another good question. I think that it's, it's all a function of the process of getting to the transformation reasoning, right? We like to break transformations down into small, like we said, this one degree of change, this mo getting the quick wins. We might have a project plan that will span a couple of years for a transformation, but we don't like to really look at it at that level because then it's very difficult to truly understand the risk areas within those. And the risk areas can be human capital, there can be financial, it can be regulatory. We know all the different risk categories. But when something's very big, it's very hard to truly analyze it. So we try to break those projects down into, at most, a two or three month window, right? So that we can have much more visibility on those analyses, those gap analyses. And what we do in Rapid is we do a lot of gap analysis. Like I said, we do human capital gap, we do skills gaps, we do financial gap analysis. We do So there's all these analysis that we want to do. That's again, it's part of the analysis phase, even before we generate the plan. So we have it baked in. That's why... So when you think about rapid, we're using customer value as the first thing that's done. And then business outcomes are the second thing that we want to align with customer value. Everything has to be aligned back. There's no disconnect in the data chain. It's like a traceability with a software development project, but it's going to customer value, right? How do you trace back yeah. this thing you said all the way to the customer value it's going to generate? So that value chain is maintained throughout everything. And then once we do all those gap analyses, we do a risk inventory. We do a literal risk inventory that addresses all of those items before the plan is even generated. Uh, that's why research first, analyze second, plan is third, right? You don't start yeah. building any plans, come up with any execution strategy or anything until you have this body of data in front of you. And depending on the size of the company, that for us, it will typically take between a month and three months to collect and analyze all of that information. And part of it, by the way, is also a lot of one-on-one -on -one human interviews. As you said, the resistors and the early adopters, and we'll go interview people on the manufacturing floor who are working on specific machines. And you know, we want everyone involved in our interview. So I'll tell you, we did a, about an 80-person company transformation, and we talked to 60 people. <laughs> <laughs> wow. as part of that process. So we really want to make sure yeah. that they feel that they've been heard, right? Not just that yeah. this is being put on them. So it's a common theme for me. You're hearing like the people are the most important thing. We talk to the people, we engage the people, and 
we do all these analysis with that in mind. And we have a basically 100% execution success rate over 25 years because we don't leave anything to chance. We talk to the people. Yeah. We do all the analysis. We dig in. We understand everything that's going on. And it doesn't hurt that our software frameworks are designed around customization and things like that. It's hard for me to say specifically other than you got to do the work. Risk Managing risk yeah. requires the hard work. <laughs> There's no other way around it. There's no magic to it. But don't forget the people. That's the key. Yeah. The people. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and maybe more to go a bit deeper on the topic of risk. As you are present and you have been uh, helping companies in different parts of the world, have you seen that, I would say, the definition of risk is seen differently in different parts of the world? That maybe in Europe they see risk much more strictly than in other parts? And how has been your experience with that topic when you speak with management? And uh, which parts of the world was the most challenging ones when it came to the topic risk? Oh, that's a really good... I would think risk as a classic definition, I think, is the same everywhere we've worked. How people react to the risk has been different. I would say that in Europe... What we've seen more is a more holistic view towards risk. The companies we've worked with are looking at it not just from a financial perspective. In North America, it's always very much financially driven, right? What's the financial risk? Okay, what happens if we do that? For example, in Europe, we have a lot of discussions about reputational risk, brand risk. With the larger companies here in the U.S., we have that. But with more midsize, or, and I say we mostly deal with midsize organizations. They're much more financially driven here than they are there. I mean, I wouldn't say it's black and white. It's maybe broken in thirds. Like I would say it's reputational, financial, and then organizational in Europe. And then in the US, I would say it's like 60% financial, <laughs> 40% wow. everything else. When we work with companies here and we raise a risk, they want to know immediately what's the financial impact? Like what happens if it happens? Yeah. What's the probability and financial impact, right? Because that combination yeah. drives that ultimate risk score. Some of them will only make their decisions based on that, which I've, I haven't seen that in all of the work that I've done overseas. Yeah, especially when I think about all the years I've been working for companies in Europe, there are also a lot about, you know, what kind of uh, certifications a certain company have and where the database and uh, where is the data being mm -hmm. stored and uh, what, which is the backup plan in case something goes wrong. And they have like a sequence of other types of thoughts and not only then that one metric that you mentioned from the U.S., for example. I was speaking more strategically, I think. I thought your answer was more like high level question, but those are pretty much the same, by the way. The engineering okay. approach, the technology approach, sort of the risk, data privacy approach to the risk, data governance, data geography, data location, pretty much standardized. Yeah. I haven't seen a big difference between questions in Europe and questions in the US or mm -hmm. in South America or Canada or even in Africa where we do some work. Everyone wants to know those questions. Where's the data? Who has control? Who has access? Et cetera, et cetera. So from a purely tech risk, it's pretty standardized across the globe. Perfect. Good to know. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that with us. The final question for today is, what are the three questions business leaders should ask themselves before embarking on a digital transformation? Three questions. So the first one would be, do I really understand the value I deliver to my customers? That's number one. Number two, do my people really understand the value that we deliver to our customers? And then number three, what will that transformation enable the business to do that is different than what we do today? How will it differentiate us even more within the market? Those are the three questions. Yeah. It was not an easy question, but uh, <laughs> you were able to very elegantly get those out. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ali. And well, therefore, we have now come to the end of our episode for this podcast. And my final question is for our listeners. Where can they find you and your company and your services? Thanks, Juan. So you can find the company at realware.com. Uh, that's R-E-A-L-W-A-R-E.com. That has all of our corporate services there. I also have a uh, personal website for the book, and it's alidavachi.com. By the way, on that, you can also get a free chapter of the book and get a free copy of the tools that are in the back of the book in digital format. Mm. So feel free to go there and request those, and we'll be happy to send those to you. I'm also on uh, Twitter under Ali Devachi and LinkedIn as well. So feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Perfect. Well, I'll be putting that into the show notes as links. So in case anybody is listening to this while driving or doing anything else and you cannot take notes, then just uh, click on the link and then you will have access to Ali. 
That was a wonderful conversation. I definitely learned a few new things and also made me reflect back on the times when I used to work very closely together with the IT people. And I'm so happy that now we have a method like the ones that you have been putting into your book to align everything together. Because before I just felt like I'm in my world and they're in their world and somehow we could not communicate so efficiently with each other. And that's why that, that was one of the things that really um, awoken my attention to have that conversation with you today, because I really like the way how you can unite all of that together. So thanks for your time, Ali. And well, maybe we see each other soon again for another future podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Juan. I would love it. Be great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Ali. In the show notes, you will find all the links on where to find him and his company and how to contact Ali. As we discovered through this conversation, to have a successful digital transformation, it has a lot to do with change management and getting people on board. We are all in the people business. It has to do with company culture and speaking the same language that everybody understands. It needs to be clear to everyone why we're doing the transformation, how we're doing it and for whom we're doing it. For most of you who are in the management role, you probably have experienced an IT transformation at some point of time. If not, then I'm sure you will have one coming in the near future. In either case, I encourage you to pause for a moment and reflect on what was discussed and choose at least one interesting point that you would like to consider during the upcoming digital transformation in your company. I hope you found this episode valuable. Please rate, subscribe, send in your comments and share with those who you think could profit from this episode. It's very much appreciated and I am grateful for your messages. I am also a work in progress and strive to do things better every day. This podcast was sponsored by Wave Business Excellence Footprint, where we believe that investing in yourself and in your employees is the best investment. Therefore, if you're interested in finding out more about courses and certification programs that were designed for you as a manager to further boost your business excellence initiative, then please go to Courses for Managers tab in the company website www.wave-bef.com, where you will find seven interesting courses for you as a leader. On the other hand, if you want to further develop your team members and your high performers so they can bring even more value by learning new skills and methods for solving process issues, please select Courses for Employees tab on our website. Here you will find 15 courses designed for your employees. In case you already have team members who are certified in any of the Lean Six Sigma levels, we also have extra courses for them as well. Thank you, stay tuned and see you in the next episode of Business Excellence for Managers.